I'm going to be speaking about science and spiritual practices. Um, and I'm doing it now because I think we're in a unique situation at the moment. We have access to spiritual practices from virtually the entire world, all different traditions. Right here in London, you can learn almost any kind of spiritual practice. You can do Sufi dancing, you can do Christian meditation, you can do shamanic drumming. Uh, um, underground, you can do shamanic ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, there's every kind of spiritual bhajan chanting. Uh, every kind of spiritual practice is now available to us. That's never happened before. And another thing that's very new about our present situation is that these practices are now being investigated scientifically in a way that has not happened before. Uh, starting in the 1970s with meditation, uh, there have now been thousands of studies in, uh, in peer-reviewed scientific journals about the effects of religious and spiritual practices. And the general message that these studies show is that these practices make people healthier, happier, and live longer. Um, presumably the converse is also true. People who don't have religious or spiritual practices are unhappier, unhealthier, and live shorter. In other words, I think militant atheism should come with a health warning um, because it puts people off their traditional religious practices and doesn't give anything in exchange except a feeling of intellectual superiority. Now, this is something that a new generation of atheists have themselves noticed, and um, there's been a tremendous shift in mood within the atheist movement itself. Um, younger atheists like Sam Harris, one of the so-called new atheists, in the United States. He is, he's now giving online meditation courses. Um, Alain de Botton, an atheist philosopher, wrote a book called Religion for Atheists uh, because he thought that once people had given up their traditional practices, it left a vacuum in their lives that needed to be filled. And he's trying to reinvent the practices of religion for people who are atheists. There's now an atheist church in Britain with at least 70 branches called the Sunday Assembly. They meet on Sundays, they sing happy songs, tell uplifting stories. And in fact, they've now stopped calling it an atheist church. They now prefer to be called mystical humanists. So we've got a very interesting uh, set of developments going on here. And the front line in the debate between people of faith and atheists is no longer uh, one lot saying there's no point in any spiritual or religious practices and the other lot saying yes there is. It's a question of how you interpret the spiritual practices because practically everyone agrees about their value. Um, I myself as a scientist and also as a spiritual explorer have tried many different spiritual practices and regularly practice quite a number of them. And which is my personal motive for these two books, which uh, Emma introduced you to, Science and Spiritual Practices, and its sequel, Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, which came out in paperback just a week ago. Um, in these books, I, each book, I look at seven different spiritual practices. Uh, in Science and Spiritual Practices, meditation, gratitude, connecting with the more-than-human world, nature, relating to plants, singing and chanting, um, rituals, and pilgrimage. Um, in the more recent book, uh, Ways, to go, Ways to Go Beyond, I look at sports, uh, which I think is the most common way in the modern world that people enter altered states of consciousness. It's not usually thought of as a spiritual practice, but it has a remarkable spiritual dimension. Learning from animals, again, not something that's usually... Uh, thought of as a spiritual practice, but which I think is one of the reasons that people keep animals. Um, I'll say more about these later. Um, then fasting uh, is common to all religious traditions, and there's a great deal known about the physiology of fasting and its effects. Again, I should probably say something about that. I have a perhaps more controversial chapter called Spiritual Openings Through Cannabis and Psychedelics, um, because I think for many people today, psychedelics act as a kind of rite of passage to wider visions of consciousness. A chapter on prayer, uh, a chapter on holy days and festivals, and finally, a chapter about 
cultivating virtues, avoiding vices, and being kind. Because unless there's an ethical dimension to all this, some of these practices can become rather selfish, just about feeling good. Uh, whereas they're all really meant to enhance our sense of connection to each other and to the greater reality within which we live. And when we have that greater sense of connection, we have a greater sense of kindred uh, with uh, a wider world than just the narrowest band of our family and closest friends. As our sense of kindred is widened, we can become kinder, because kindness and kindred are the same root. So let me start by saying a few words about gratitude, which I think is perhaps the most fundamental uh, spiritual practice. It's encouraged in all religious traditions and it's just part of good manners. I mean, children, one of most people who've raised children have spent quite a lot of time telling them to say thank you and write thank you letters and so on. Um, it's just part of g g considerate behaviour. But it's also a fundamental principle uh, uh, of spirituality. It's now been investigated scientifically by the School of Positive Psychology. Within psychology, since about the year 2000, there's been a school called Positive Psychology, which is about what makes people happy. Most psychology prior to that was about what makes people miserable. Um, so it's quite original within psychology to study happiness and well-being. And one of the things that the positive psychologist discovered with, by interviewing and studying happy people is that happy people tend to be grateful people. And then the critics said, well, of course they're grateful. They're grateful because they're happy. So what they tried to find out is whether they're happy because they're grateful. And uh, they did experiments, being scientists, and they're fairly simple-minded experiments, but one of their classic experiments involved dividing a group of people into three subgroups at random. One lot made a list of all the things that had annoyed them in the previous week, their hassles and problems. Another wrote a story about something that had happened in the previous week. And the third group wrote a list of things for which they felt grateful in the previous week. And the people who did nothing more than write a list of things for which they felt grateful were measurably happier for days afterwards. And their most effective uh, experiment involved what they called a gratitude letter. They asked people to write a letter thanking someone who'd helped them in their lives, a teacher, a family member, a friend, who they'd never properly acknowledged, and then go and read the letter to that person. People who did that were uh, measurably happier for up to two months afterwards. It had a huge effect. So there's now a great deal of evidence that the practice of gratitude um, can give rise to uh, a greater sense of flow and connection. The opposite of gratitude is taking things for granted or a feeling of entitlement. And instead of thanking, complaining. Uh, just feeling you, you, uh, the world owes you all these things, you, you don't, you, that you deserve them, and, and if anything goes wrong, you then complain. Such people are also, the positive psychologists found, uh, less popular than people who are grateful and happy. It's not really surprising, is it? But now there's a seal of scientific approval on this rather common sense fact. Um, so the, uh, this, I think the practice of gratitude works because we all receive so much as part of a flow, and if we're not grateful, the flow stops with us. If we're grateful, we, give, we pass on the sense of being part of a flow. We give back something through our gratitude, and we become part of a flow. And the spiritual uh, practices are all about the sense of connection. I'll come later to why so many different practices can work in giving a sense of connection. Anyway, gratitude is a fundamental practice, and it's something that all of us can do. I mean, if, if some of you probably do it anyway, but counting your blessings, making, just making a mental list or a written list of what you're grateful for will make you happier and feel more connected. And there are simple practices that we can all take up. And, uh, well, until about 100 years ago, or maybe 50 years ago, most people in Britain gave thanks before a meal. They said grace. Um, nowadays, very few people do. We're in a secular world, and people don't want to say grace because they're afraid of annoying any atheists who might be present or upsetting secularists or people of other faiths or whatever. 
Um, but actually, it's relatively easy to restore this. In, in our own family, we always hold hands before we eat. Uh, uh, if there are more people, and it's a special occasion, someone says grace, or we sing grace uh, on, on uh, bigger occasions. Um, and it makes a lot of difference just to have that pause before the meal when there's a t- chance to give thanks. And it's very traditional in all cultures and traditions, really. Um, at the end of each chapter in these books, I have suggestions for simple practices that you can actually put into practice in your own life. Now, the, uh, the practice that's been studied most is meditation. And studies in the 1970s uh, looked at, starting in the 70s, there have been many since then, looked at the two most common kinds of meditation, ones that are based on mantras, for example, transcendental meditation or Christian meditation involving sacred phrases or Sufi meditation in, involving wazifas, so a repetitive use of words, um, or mindfulness meditation, looking at the breathing or sensations in the body. And the, these two kinds of meditation have now been very extensively studied. And they've shown that these studies have shown that they have direct physiological effects. They reduce blood pressure, slow down heartbeat, um, give people a greater sense of relaxation. The relaxation response is part of this meditation. It really people are normally many people are very get very tense and anxious. Adrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system are about fear and worry. And uh, meditation reduces those and more activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is about, more about relaxation and feeling uh, able to be in the present rather than always being vigilant about something bad that might happen. Um, they also lead to changes in brain activity. Um, the, there's a, region of, uh, a series of regions of the brain that are linked together in what's called the default mode network which are activated when you're ruminating, thinking, worrying, um, uh, the chattering mind. And in meditation, this network becomes less active. um, And and that's one of the reasons for the uh, psychologically beneficial effects of the meditation. People who meditate tend to sleep better and are less prone to depression, which is why you can now get a prescription for meditation on the NHS if you have mild or moderate depression. uh, Because... uh, Studies have shown that it works as well, if not better, than antidepressant drugs. It has fewer side effects, of course, and also, from the point of view of the NHS, it has the advantage of being cheaper. So um, this, is, this is now a very secularised view of meditation. It's taught in a lot of schools. There's a parliamentary group of about 100 members of parliament regularly meet and meditate. It's taught in prisons. Uh, the benefits are very widely known, and it's very widely practised. Incidentally, how many people here meditate or have meditated? So you know what I'm talking about, but I don't need to describe the experience of it. It's interesting when we think about it that how this spiritual practice has been secularized in this way. Um, and when you, uh, the, the question then becomes, what's it really about? I mean, for most people who do it because they're leading frazzled lives and need to relax, Ruby Wax, the comedian, wrote a book called Frazzled, advocating meditation for those who lead busy, frazzled urban lives. But that's not why people meditated in caves in the Himalayas or why (coughs) Sufis meditated or why contemplative Christian monks and nuns meditated in monasteries or through contemplative prayer, which is another word for meditation. Um, They were doing it because... They thought the very foundation of our own mind or consciousness is part of the divine or ultimate mind or consciousness. And that through uh, letting go of the chattering dialogue, uh, internal dialogue, we can come to that basis of our own consciousness, which is none other than the divine consciousness. The uh, Hindus have a, 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 um, an image that they have of this, which I think makes it quite clear. They have this image of lots of buckets of water uh, outside uh, in a moon, on a moonlit night. Tonight is, is, is very moonlit. It be a good night for this. And you see uh, reflections of the moon in every bucket of water. It looks as if there are hundreds of different moons, but they're actually all reflections of the one moon. 
And so the, our own consciousness is all derived from the ultimate consciousness, Brahman. And um, so people in these traditions have meditated because that brings them into contact with the divine. And because the divine mind is blissful by its very nature, the Hindus call it Satchit Ananda, being consciousness bliss, um, then it's often a very blissful experience. Many of these uh, mystical or spiritual experiences are blissful because they contact this ultimate source of bliss. That's why people traditionally have done it. Um, now, if you're an atheist and a materialist and you meditate, you still experience the benefits. But most atheists and materialists, well, by definition, uh, they believe there's no such thing as consciousness out there. The whole universe is unconscious. There's no conscious ground of its being. Um, uh, consciousness exists only inside brains, and especially human brains, and the rest of the universe is completely non-conscious. That is the atheist materialist belief system. Um, and so when they meditate, they have to persuade themselves that it's all just happening inside their brain, sort of short-circuiting bits of the brain or changing uh, patterns of uh, neurotransmitter release and so on. Um, uh, but I think actually for those who start meditating through their own experiences, they're likely to change their view of consciousness. And I've noticed how a number of atheists who meditate are beginning to think in a much broader way about consciousness, thinking maybe there is some form of consciousness beyond my own mind. And after all, these direct experiences of connection with the consciousness, a far higher level of consciousness than our own, are the very basis of all religious teachings. They all start from this direct experience of the divine. Buddha didn't become enlightened by doing a PhD. Um, you know, he became enlightened through years of meditation, sitting under trees. Jesus didn't become uh, aware of his connection with God, his unique connection with God, through uh, studying in a seminary. He became aware of it through mystical experiences, first and foremost the one that happened at the moment of his baptism. Um, so these, uh, the, 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 this is uh, an area, the, the debate between atheists and non-atheists now becomes uh, meditation is at the very frontier of this debate. And many atheists will do it thinking, well, that it's just something in their brain. But I suspect that increasing numbers who do it that way will become aware there's more to it than that. And they really are, uh, at moments, coming into contact with a higher consciousness. Many people also have that experience through spontaneously in nature, through the beauty of nature and the immersion in nature, a feeling of connection with something far greater than themselves. In fact, many people have spontaneous mystical experiences. It used to be thought mystical experiences were very rare um, and that were confined to a few medieval saints uh, and, and religious leaders centuries ago. Um, but surveys have shown that uh, as many as 50% of the population have had uh, spiritual experiences spontaneously, some of them through near-death experiences, to which I'll come back. Petitionary prayer is, um, in a sense, the opposite of meditation. Um, in petitionary prayer, which is prayer asking for things, the commonest kind of prayer that people pray is praying where they're asking for something, for protection, for healing, for, uh, for someone they love who's having trouble. Um, there are many reasons for praying in this petitionary way, asking for things. And it's a, a very... <coughs> The most common kind of prayer in all traditions is found in virtually all traditions, shamanic societies, in all religions. Uh, there are forms of petitionary prayer. And um, the petitionary prayer, in a sense, is going in an opposite direction to meditation. In meditation, you let go of involvement with the world. You sort of go into a quiet place, sit down in sitting meditation, close your eyes in many cases, uh, and stop being engaged with the outer world, and then through the mantra or the breathing, uh, detach your attention from that train of thought which is going through the mind. The thoughts still come, but the idea is to have another focus of attention so you don't get sucked into them or uh, totally attached to them. Um, and so uh, uh, it's withdrawing from an engagement with the world and with thoughts to the very 
core of consciousness itself, awareness in the present. Whereas petitionary prayer works in the opposite direction. You start by an invocation of some greater being, our Father, who art in heaven, Hail Mary, full of grace, Om Namah Shivaya, an invocation uh, which you start with, you connect with that greater form of consciousness. And then, through your intention, uh, direct that to the uh, things you're concerned about in the outer world, uh, or in the inner world, or in your own, if you're praying for your own healing or guidance, then about your own life. But there, here are the specific intentions linked to um, a higher consciousness. So I see petitionary prayer as like breathing out, and meditation as like breathing in. They're complementary to each other, but they're, very, they're doing a different thing. I myself do both. I meditate in the mornings soon after I get up, and I always pray in the evenings. I'm a Christian, so I start with the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary, and then I go on in a free form to pray about things that have happened in the day, things I'm worried about, members of my family, friends, the wider world, um, and a whole range of topics in different topics. So I myself see these as complementary practices, but uh, on, the, on the whole, in most uh, people, in the modern world, petitionary prayer is, is not as common as meditation. Actually, how many people here pray uh, as opposed to meditate? That's interesting. You see, I should say it's about a third. And, uh, and I'm sure, and since practically everyone meditates, those of you who pray obviously do both, um, which I do myself. But I think that the, 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 there's been a much more, there's much more emphasis in the modern world on teaching meditation because it's secularized and it's not controversial, whereas prayer happens within specific traditions. So if you teach Christian prayer in school, then you'll get objections from atheists and uh, people from other religions may not want their children to participate and so on. If you treat, teach Muslim prayers, then you'll get objections. So prayer is more um, specific to particular traditions and, and to avoid all these controversies, people just ignore it. So most children are brought up with no education in how to pray, even though they may be taught how to meditate. And I myself think both are very important and uh, they're doing different things. Um, akin to prayer is a secularized version of it, positive thinking. Uh, positive thinking is very popular in America. It has been since the 19th century. There have been endless books there, The Secret, uh, you know, the Norman Vincent Peale's book, The Power of Positive Thinking, which is about how you create thoughts and you can get what you want through creating positive intentions that thoughts shape the world. But positive thinking is secularized. It's about getting what you want, you know, success in love and business. Norman Vincent Peale's book on the power of positive thinking is all about how you can sell more vacuum cleaners or encyclopedias uh, using the power of positive thinking. It's not about doing God's will or placing this within the context of the greater good. It's using the power of thought to change the world in a way that suits you. And I must say the most extraordinary exponent of this uh, is currently at work demonstrating the power of this in a most amazing way, which is the President of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Trump, as a boy, uh, grew up in New York. His parents were devotees of Norman Vincent Peale. He used to go every Sunday as a teenager to Norman Vincent Peale's Protestant church in Manhattan. The, the Marble Temple is called, it's still there, with a statue of Norman Vincent Peale outside it. Um, and um, uh, Vincent, Norman Vincent Peale married Trump, Trump to his first wife. What he learned is that what you think is much more important than the reality, and you change the reality by the way you think. So if not many people show up to his inauguration, then he just says, the place was full, you know, it crowded, all these great crowds had come. And he creates this reality on a daily basis through his tweets uh, by, by this e extraordinary demonstration of the power of thoughts. Now, I think Trump's example also shows us that positive thinking is not necessarily a benign force uh, because it's not about doing God's will or the greater good. It's about getting what you want. Uh, but he demonstrates extraordinarily powerfully uh, how this can work in, in a way that's actually changing the history of the world. 
So, um, you know, prayer is, uh, it can, can be distorted and, and it can be used wrongly like anything, uh, at least in a secularized form, which is why uh, people who pray within religious traditions uh, are doing it within a larger context that's not all about themselves. In the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, uh, is, is a key part. You start with that before you start asking for anything else. So, um, let me move on now to rituals. Uh, rituals are uh, common to all religious traditions and indeed secular traditions. And there are several kinds of ritual. Um, the, uh, there are rituals of remembrance, which are particularly important um, in uh, the Jewish, Christian and Islamic traditions. Uh, they're rituals about primal events. And in fact, they're important in all traditions because all cultures have myths or stories of origins about primal events that have happened uh, that give uh, the group its identity. For example, the Jewish feast of the Passover, which happens every year, um, is a reenacting of the Passover dinner of the Jewish people in Egypt on that last night before they left Egypt and their slavery and bondage in Egypt to begin their journey through the wilderness to the promised land. <laughs> and um, in that Passover dinner, they reenact the dinner, eating a lamb uh, with bitter herbs in haste and tell the story of the original Passover. Through taking part in the ritual, people become Jewish or they become aware of their Jewish identity, part of a Jewish group, and connect with all those who've done it before, every year, right back to the original Passover. The Christian Holy Communion, uh, reenacting Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, itself a Passover dinner, um, is uh, so through participating in this ritual meal, Christians become, uh, they affirm their identity as Christians, connect with others who are doing it in the same ritual and throughout the world, and with all those who've done it before, right back to the first time. The American Thanksgiving dinner is an example of a national or secular ritual uh, where every year Americans reenact the Thanksgiving dinner of the first settlers in, in the New World uh, who gave thanks for surviving in that new environment. And they reenact uh, that Thanksgiving dinner. Now, one of the things about these rituals, uh, in fact, all rituals, is that they have a conservative quality. People believe that for them to work, they have to be done the same way or in a similar way to the way they were done before. And that includes ritual languages. Um, in, uh, for example, in the Coptic church in Egypt, the liturgy uh, involves uh, words and phrases from ancient Egyptian, the only form in which they still survive. In the, in the Russian Orthodox church, it's old Slavonic. Um, in the uh, Brahminic rituals of India, it's Sanskrit, which is no longer a common a spoken language. Um, of course, in Muslim rituals, it's Arabic, which is still a spoken language, but the particularly Quranic forms of Arabic uh, become the key thing. And so this cons the conservatism of language is also part of this idea that it has to be done the same as before, uh, as similarly as possible. Now, why should it be that rituals have this conservative quality? Um, I think the one reason for it could be through the principle I call morphic resonance. I don't have time to explain this whole hypothesis this evening, but in a nutshell, it's the idea that there's a kind of memory in nature, that the laws of nature are more like habits. Each species has a kind of collective memory uh, on which uh, all individuals draw and to which they contribute. Um, and morphic resonance is the principle by which this memory works. It's the on the basis of similarity. If a pattern of activity in a self-organizing system is similar to what's happened before, there'll be a resonance across space and time from the past conveying this information or memory. And so there's a kind of non-material basis of memory uh, through resonance with systems in the past on the basis of similarity. The more similar, the greater the resonance. This hypothesis, um, it, one of its most controversial aspects, is that it suggests that our own memories uh, depend on resonance. We're more similar to ourselves in the past than we are to anyone else. Um, so we pick up our own memories by a kind of resonance. We also pick up memories of other people 
uh, through a collective memory, like Jung's collective unconscious, but they're not as similar as ourselves, which is why we have specific memories. Um, the, so I think the brain is more like a TV receiver than a video recorder. Um, the standard theory, of course, is that memories are stored as material traces in the brain, but people have tried to find them for over 100 years and haven't succeeded, uh, so they just try harder, because they, they, you can't, within the materialist framework of institutional science at present, um, say, well, maybe they're not there at all. Uh, that's not how it works. However, you can test this theory, and I discuss tests of it in my books, um, The Presence of the Past and the New Science of Life. But I mention this because, coming back to rituals, this principle of morphic resonance helps illuminate why rituals work the way they do. The more similarly you do this pattern of activities, including the words, the phrases, the gestures, the kind of food, etc., uh, to in the present, the more you resonate with those who've done it before. And so there really is a kind of presence of the past uh, through the performance of these rituals. And so the rituals connect us with those who've done it before, with people in the present who are doing the same ritual, uh, with people in the past who've done it, our ancestors and previous generations, and with the primal event uh, to which it relates back. So um, chanting and, uh, uh, is a very powerful form of uh, coming into resonance, and it's used in many religious ceremonies and, and rituals. My wife, Jill Purse, has been teaching chanting in workshops for uh, more than 30 years now. And I've seen, uh, through seeing people go to her workshop and doing them myself, how chanting together has such a powerful effect. It brings people into resonance with each other. Well, first of all, with their own bodies, because when you chant, your body vibrates. Um, you, vib you come into resonance with others. You're chanting together, you're breathing together when you sing or chant with other people. And if you're doing sacred chants, you're coming into morphic resonance with those who've done those chants before. So it's a triple resonance effect, personal, group, and through morphic resonance with the tradition and those who've done it in the past. There are other kinds of ritual which are rites of passage, and all traditional cultures have rites of passage for when we change our social roles. Being born is a rite of passage. Dying Funerals are rites of passage, and there are marriage is a rite of passage. And also there are many cultures that have rites of passage for moving from adolescence to adulthood. And those rites often involve trials by ordeal or um, uh, the, uh, experiences that put people to the very limit of their, of their lives. So they're, they're often portrayed in terms of the imagery of being di dying and being born again in a new way, in a new role. And I think that some rites of passage of that kind do actually involve near-death experiences. I think they deliberately induce them. Because um, more people than ever um, nearly die. Um, thanks to modern medicine, many people who almost die in medical emergencies or heart attacks are resuscitated. Um, so near-death experiences are becoming more common and they're being studied scientifically as well. Um, many people who've had them have similar experiences. You will have read about them, some of you may have had them, but often they experience them, people float, float out of their body, see themselves from above, then go through a kind of tunnel or tube um, and emerge into a realm where it's full of light, joy, love, a feeling of blessedness um, and peace. Um, and people sometimes meet deceased relatives or beings of light. People from a Christian background often meet Christ as a being of light. Um, so, the, and then of course they have to come back because it's only a near death experience, not a death experience. Um, but people who've had these near death experiences very often say that their lives have been completely changed by it, that they're, they're, they've lost the fear of death, they've become much more aware of a spiritual dimension, and, and it transforms their lives, usually in a very benevolent way, a way that changes them for the better. Now, you can see that if it's possible artificially to induce near-death experiences, you'd have these tremendously spiritual transformative effects. And I think that some rites of passage are deliberately designed to do that. The one that I think is hiding in plain sight 
is baptism. John the Baptist, according to the New Testament, was baptizing people in the River Jordan on an almost industrial scale. People were flocking to the Jordan. He was, uh, one by one, they went into the river. He held them under, and then they came up again, and many had their lives changed, including Jesus, whose first reported spiritual experience happened as he came up from this uh, experience of baptism. The heavens opened. He felt himself in the presence of God. The Spirit of God descended upon him. And um, it, it was clearly the beginning of his... It was the thing that was his first manifestation in public of this direct connection with God, his first direct awareness of it, according to the biblical account. Now, um, I think what was going on in, in John the Baptist's rituals was effectively drowning. I think John the Baptist was a drowner. And I think he um, was holding people under, I think, just long enough to induce a near-death experience by drowning. And now, people usually... People, people usually interpret this uh, by saying that it was a symbolic of death by drowning. But why have something that's merely symbolic when you can have the real thing? And, and it, only takes a couple of minutes longer. And um, the, um, I, I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to go and be baptised by him when he was just starting out. You know, he, might, <laughs> he might have lost a few. Um, but that was before uh, liability litigation. Um, and uh, so I think that he could actually have induced a feeling of dying, seeing the light and being born again. Within a few generations, the early Christian church wanted children to be baptised and adopted infant baptism instead of baptism of adults uh, by total immersion. Um, And this experience, this transformative experience, faded away. It was revived during that tremendous ferment of religious ferment in the Reformation. And radical, the most radical groups of Reformation people read the Bible read about John the Baptist, saw that the Roman church was not doing that, baptism wasn't being done in this original way, and they restored baptism by total immersion. And they were called Anabaptists. Anna, A-N-A, means again. So they were baptizing people again in what they thought was the proper way. And what they went round filled with religious fervor. They, They went round... They went round saying they died, they'd seen the light, and they'd been born again. And they were clearly changed people. They were terribly unpopular with the Roman Catholic and the official Protestant churches because most people weren't having these experiences and um, were very suspicious of them. They felt they had a direct hotline to God and no need to listen to bishops and things. Um, So they were very unpopular in Europe and they were persecuted and they went to America as soon as they could. There there are still Baptist churches here, but in America they became the basis of the Baptist churches, the Amish, the Mennonite, and these various Baptist sects in the United States. And it's still today among the Southern Baptists in Texas and elsewhere that you hear people talking about dying, seeing the light, and being born again. It's very much part of their tradition. And they see this rite of passage as being fundamentally important in establishing this spiritual connection. I don't know how many American Baptists or British Baptists uh, induce near-death experiences. I imagine health and safety concerns have rather uh, limited what the effectiveness of this today. I just don't know. It's not been researched as far as I know. Uh, But I think that um, when we see it in that light, we can see how a rite of passage could be truly transformative Uh, for many people. I think one reason uh, that psychedelics are so popular today, um, especially among younger people, is because they actually give this kind of rite of passage. Stan Groff, who investigated the effects of LSD in the 1960s and 70s while it was still legal, uh, studied more than 2,500 people who'd taken LSD. And he found that many of them had had what were very like near-death experiences. They'd felt that they were in a place where they were constricted, where they felt they were being crushed, 
where they felt they were confined, where they felt that the, the, their life was coming to an end, that they were dying, they were in, and some felt they were in hell. Um, then uh, they had the experience of either rising to the surface of water or going through a kind of tube or tunnel and emerging into the light where they felt peace, joy and blessedness. I myself took LSD around 1970, 71, I can't remember exactly when, uh, for the first time. And I had an experience exactly like this. I'd never read Stan Groff's book, but it was for me a near-death experience and one that completely changed my view of consciousness. It was nothing in my scientific education that prepared me for this. And it led to a view of the mind and consciousness as vastly greater than anything I'd been told about. And in my case, it, I took up transcendental meditation um, and uh, spiritual practices as a result of this because it opened me to these possibilities. Um, and I think many uh, young people today take psychedelics in often in very ill-advised conditions, you know, drunken parties uh, with other people who don't know what they're doing, they can get scared, uh, and so on. Uh, but I think that for people who do it under, and sometimes it produces psychotic episodes, it can be very dangerous. But I think that done in, in a supervised way with guidance, that it can provide a, a near-death type experience that is spiritually transformative. Not only LSD, but DMT, dimethyltryptamine, uh, often induces very powerful near-death type experiences, and also um, ayahuasca. Um, Interestingly, there are now psychedelic churches in which you can actually take psychedelics as part of a, a, a ritual. In Brazil, the Roman Catholic Church sent missionaries into the Amazon where the shamanic cultures there took ayahuasca as part of their spiritual and healing practice. And within a few generations, what emerged was psychedelic churches. The best known is Santo Daime, which is... Uh, based in the Amazon in Brazil, but now has branches all over Brazil and indeed all over Europe. It's underground here, but uh, some people sometimes called a reverse missionary movement, um, where uh, Santo Daime uh, leaders are leading groups here in England, ceremonies where people actually take this uh, powerful psychedelic brew of ayahuasca in a ceremonial form, praising God, and start, these services start with the Hail Mary and the Our Father, and and they have songs and hymns. So here's a form of psychedelic Christianity, uh, which is one of the examples of the rapid evolution of religion and spirituality that's going on today. Um, it's now legal in many parts of the world. Um, so I think that when we see that psychedelics can perform that function, um, then we can see them in a, in a positive way and also see how this can be positively transformative for people. Um, I'm not advocating that everyone takes them and I, they're not suitable for everyone, but I think it's important to recognise that for many people today, they have had a transformative role. They certainly did for me, and I'm always meeting people who have had similar experiences. Um, it's not that they go on taking psychedelics all the time or have it every day or something, but it op it's a, like a rite of passage that opens up a new realm of consciousness. Some religious people say that psychedelics shouldn't be taken seriously because it's cheating. Uh, you're getting there uh, in a way that doesn't involve lengthy procedures which uh, ought to be painful or hard work. But actually, that argument isn't terribly powerful because a lot of people have spontaneous mystical experiences with no hard work at all. Near-death experiences, for example, um, are, are not things people seek out and they don't involve them uh, spending years of preparation or spiritual practice, they just happen. So, um, now I would like to say a little bit, finally, um, well, let me just say one thing about sports, because um, that's perhaps one of the most surprising aspects of, of um, uh, looking at spiritual experiences in this way. Um, for many people in the modern world, sports uh, involve coming into the present in an intense way which can have extremely powerful spiritual effects. A uh, lot of sports people don't talk about this. But um, the, the point about it is, first and foremost, that uh, being engaged in a physical activity of a sport um, involves shutting down the default mode network. 
which happens in meditation but slower and often less effectively. I first realized this when I was talking to an American friend who has been a very successful and powerful businessman who told me that uh, when he was most busy, he couldn't stop thinking, he couldn't sleep, his mind was constantly going on and on with his constant thoughts. Um, he tried meditation, it didn't work very well. But he's also a mountaineer, and he said that what really worked for him was rock climbing. By the time he was 50 feet up a rock face, the only thing that mattered was where the next finger hold was, or toe hold. He was totally in the present. If you're in a football game, someone's passing you the ball, crowds are cheering, you have to be totally present to respond to it. If you're skiing downhill at 60 miles an hour, if you start worrying about whether you paid the gas bill or something like that, you'll go over a cliff and you'll be dead. The thrill of speed, for those who like fast uh, motorcycling and driving cars fast and um, other forms of speedy sports, is again about the danger that you're on the very edge of being dead and you have to be totally concentrated. And I think that in the modern world, sports are the principal way in which people achieve this sense of coming into the present. And it's only through being in the present that you can feel that greater presence. The divine present, presence is, you can feel it only in the present. And you can't feel it if your thoughts and distractions are constantly taking you out of the present through Facebook, social media, entertainment, advertisements, etc. And the inner dialogue, they're all taking you away from being fully present. And sports do that for many people. I think that's the principal reason people uh, actually do these sports. And by sport here, I mean physical activity. There are games that are not sports, like chess. There are sports that are not games, like mountain climbing or downhill skiing um, or uh, skydiving. Um, and, and I think that it, it's this, it, this being in the present that has actually led to the evolution in our modern world of this peculiar phenomenon of dangerous or extreme sports, uh, which are cultivated precisely because they're so dangerous. Uh, the danger enhances, gives that extra enhancement to this feeling of being in the present. Now, let me uh, say something now about pilgrimage. Um, pilgrimage is found in all cultures and societies. Our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, and they moved around the landscape, usually in an annual cycle, like the Australian Aboriginal song lines. They, they moved around and they came to places that were sacred in their cultural story, and in the Australian Aborigines sang the song of those places as they came to them, as they moved around the landscape. And connecting with those places and their stories was a key part of their life. When people settled down and, uh, in agricultural societies, they still had sacred places they went to for festivals or ceremonies. Stonehenge, for example, here in England, uh, was like a temple to which people went for festivals, probably mainly at the solstices, um, maybe equinoxes. Um, they, it wasn't in the centre of the city, but it was a place they converged to the festival. It was like a pilgrimage, go, and then going back again. So I th then uh, we find pilgrimage in all societies. Muslims go to Mecca. Many Sufis go to shrines of Sufi saints, dargahs they're called in India. Um, um, Hindus have many places, caves in the Himalayas, the source of the Ganges, the sacred mountain of Kailash, um, and, of course, the great temples of India. And medieval Europe was crisscrossed with pilgrimage routes. Um, the most famous in England was, of course, the pilgrimage to Canterbury, um, Canterbury Cathedral, the shrine of St. Thomas Becket, um, and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, written around 1390, uh, the pilgrims telling each other stories on their way to Canterbury. And it's clear from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales that they weren't all terribly pious, these people. They were having a good time as well as going on a serious pilgrimage. Um, but pilgrimage... Uh, in Northern Europe, in England, for example, in Britain, uh, was suppressed at the Reformation. At the Protestant Reformation, they didn't like pilgrimage. The Protestants, uh, reformers, said there's nothing about Canterbury 
in the Bible. There's nothing about Walsingham, the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham in Norfolk in the Bible. These are basically pagan things that have come in and, and should be stripped away and re repressed and got rid of. Um, and uh, so pilgrimage was uh, ruthlessly suppressed in Protestant countries. In 1538, Thomas Cromwell, working on behalf of Henry VIII, uh, passed an injunction against pilgrimage, making it illegal in England. And the shrines were destroyed. And the infrastructure for pilgrimage, which was the monasteries, the monasteries were privatized and dissolved. Um, so uh, pilgrimage was suppressed in England, and so it was in Scandinavia, and in, 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 in Lutheran Germany, in all the Protestant countries. I think this left a void in the soul of the English, uh, which resulted several generations later in the invention of tourism. I think tourism is best seen as a form of secularised pilgrimage. Tourists still go to the great temples and holy places, but when they get there, they can't say a prayer because they're supposed to be uh, modern, enlightened, uh, secular people. They have to pretend that they've gone there primarily out of an interest in art history. And so guides spring up to fill their heads with facts and figures about uh, the history of the place, and they're not really interested in that, so it goes in one ear and out the other. Uh, but uh, they can't really relate to the place and ask for a blessing or connect with the, the holiness of that place because they're modern secular people. So I think tourism is actually best seen as a form of frustrated pilgrimage. And um, it's uh, one way that uh, we can all undergo a kind of paradigm shift is from a shift from tourism back to pilgrimage. Go as a pilgrim. I myself, when I'm uh, visiting any town or city or country, try to go to the central holy place. In India, I go to the temples. In, in, uh, I go to mosques and dergos in, in India as well. Um, here in Europe, it's usually cathedrals uh, or churches, uh, and there are other holy places too, sacred wells, holy trees, and so on. And when I um, visit a, a, a city, I try and go as soon as I can to the cathedral or the temple or the holy place at the centre of it and ask for blessings on my time in that city and you know, light a candle if it's a cathedral and, and, and say a prayer um, and ask for my time there to be blessed, to turning a journey into a pilgrimage. There's at present an re astonishing revival of pilgrimage going on all over Europe. Santiago de Compostela is the best known um, in uh, 1987, when they first re-established the infrastructure for that pilgrimage, about 1,000 people walked there. Last year, 330,000 people walked there. They're not all pious Roman Catholics. Some of them were atheists, some were agnostics, some people who are spiritual but not religious on a spiritual quest. And the, um, this has triggered off a revival of pilgrimage all over Europe. In Scandinavia, in Norway... The Shrine of St. Olaf in Trondheim Cathedral is now a major focus of pilgrimage again, walking over the mountains from Oslo. I have a teenage godson, and every year for his birthday in June, um, I take him on a pilgrimage. And when he was 14, I started this. Um, I didn't know what to give him for his birthday present, and I've stopped giving people stuff. I now give experiences. And so I, I'm his godfather, and I thought I'd do something appropriate. And so I, I offered him this. I said, would you like to go on a pilgrimage? We take the train to a village near Canterbury. We walk through meadows and orchards and woods uh, to a holy well. Then we go on to the cathedral. We circumambulate it. We walk round it clockwise first. You can, uh, the circumambulating holy place is very important. It's culturally different. Sometimes it's anti-clockwise, sometimes clockwise. It's anti-clockwise in Mecca, clockwise in the, most of India. Um, and so circumambulate the cathedral, we go into the shrine, we go with an intention, uh, we pray at the shrine, we light candles, then we have a cream tea, and then we go to choral evensong. Uh, I said to him, would you like to do that? And without hesitation, he said, yes. And we had a most wonderful day, and since then we've done a, a different cathedral every year. When he was 15, we went to Ely from walking along the River Cam from Water Beach. When he was 16, Lincoln... Uh, 17 Wells, 18 uh, Winchester, and uh, then last year, he's 19, we went to Chichester. Um, well, now there are one-day pilgrimage routes where anyone can go on a one-day pilgrimage. You can look on the 
britishpilgrimage.org website, and there you'll find uh, all these routes. And you can download them, this is Modern Pilgrimage, onto uh, your telephone, your mobile telephone, as GPX files, which will actually guide you along the way uh, as you go on the pilgrimage. So, um, again, here's a, a spiritual practice of the most fundamental kind, which couldn't be a more direct representation of being on a spiritual journey. You're going to a holy place on a spiritual journey. It's very, very powerful. I'm sure many of you have already done pilgrimages, but if you haven't, then try out some here in Britain. You don't need to go to Spain. You don't need to go abroad. Um, you can do it cheaply and simply here uh, at any of our one-day cathedral routes or other pilgrimage. Other, there are amazing other routes to Lindisfarne, to Holy Island, for example. Um, and it's a wonderful way of linking to the land. And, and they're also open to everyone. There's one of the slogans of the British Pilgrimage Trust is open to all, meaning all people, but also open to all. I mean, if you think, what is all? For people who don't like the word God, I think the word all is quite good. I mean, all is, there's nothing that isn't part of all. Um, and um, another of the slogans for some of the guided pilgrimages that the British Pilgrimage Trust organises is, bring your own beliefs. Um, it's not about signing up to a belief system, it's about an experience. These spiritual practices are about experience. And fi the final point really is that all of them are ways of connecting with that uh, spiritual, ultimate spiritual reality. And that spiritual reality has different aspects. Part of it is stillness and calm, um, which in the Hindu version Sat Chit Ananda is the beingness itself, conscious being in the present. The first annunciation of God to Moses in the burning bush was when God says, what's your name? He says, I am who I am. I am, conscious being in the present. Then that aspect of the divine, which is to do with words and forms, names and forms, Nama Rupa, the Hindus call it, in the Christian Holy Trinity, it's the logos, the principles of form and structure, and words, um, and, and, and the creation of all forms. The ultimate... Uh, source of everything is the source of all forms in nature, all things that we can not only recognize the forms but also name them. But so the forms in our minds and our names for them and the external forms are linked as they're aspects of the, the logos, the, the, the uh, chit aspect of consciousness, that which is known. The knower is, is the ground of being, and that which is known is also part of the divine. And then a very essential aspect of the divine is the dynamic principle or the spirit in Christianity. It's the Holy Spirit. In the Hindu traditions, it's often called Shakti, which is the ultimate spirit, uh, moving principle. In the Hebrew Bible, it's Ruach. And right at the very beginning of Genesis, the world was out without form. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. The world was, out, was without form and void, and the spirit moved on the face of the deep. It's the wind moving over the ocean, the waves. It's a moving principle, that this movement is part of the divine. So I think some of these spiritual practices, like sports, which are about movement, and sacred dancing and music, are relating primarily to the spirit aspect of the divine. Some, which are about being still and going into the pure awareness, like meditation, are relating to the still aspect of the divine and um, those which are concerned with forms names and forms the poetry, the visual arts um, especially the visual arts and also the beauty of nature like the beauty of flowers are concerned with that aspect of the divine which gives rise to all the forms in nature um, and so by contemplating the beauty of a flower it's not moving you're not trying to get into ultimate basis of awareness. You're connecting with the, where the logos or the nama rupa or the creative aspect of the divine, which gives rise to all the forms in nature. So if you look at these um, different spiritual practices, they relate in different ways to the ultimate reality because the ultimate reality has differentiation within it. There's ultimately one reality, but it manifests in different ways and in the in the uh, Islamic tradition with the 99 names of God are attributes uh, of the divine. They're ways in which the divine is manifested in the world. 
the creator, also the destroyer. There's a whole range of these ways in which it's manifested in the world. And so the, the, um, the divine manifests in our varied world. But these spiritual practices are about reconnecting with that source and also with each other. Um, and that's why spiritual practices work, in, in my view, and why they can help us all. Because insofar as we're connected, uh, we feel more satisfied, more truly ourselves, not in an individual egoistic way, but, but as part of a flow, part of a connected to something greater than ourselves. Insofar as we're disconnected, we're separated, and that's the ground of unhappiness, alienation, uh, and so on. Um, so, I'm sure everyone in this room has spiritual practices, um, but one of the good things about them is there's so many. Uh, you don't just have to stick to one, and they're not mutually contradictory. I think they're mutually uh, complementary, in fact. Um, so I think that's uh, enough to give an overview of this, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. <coughs>